Hey there folks, how you doing? Today we are going to talk about energy. More specifically, um, energy in the atmosphere. So, energy. What is energy? This is probably one of the first vocabulary words they, they teach you back in some of your earliest science classes. Um, uh, kids at every level are capable of understanding um, energy, whether it be a uh, battery from their toy that died, or parents yelling because they got too much energy from the sugar and the candy that they ate, or a handful of things. Okay, um, You've known this word for a very long time, and you've probably known it's very simple, straightforward definition is energy is the capacity to do work on matter. And if you go back and you think about the couple examples I just gave you, a battery, or a carrot stick, or a candy bar, did you really think of it in that context, in that way? Is a carrot stick um, the capacity to do work or, or on matter? Yeah, it is, but it's, it's really not you know, that exciting to think of it that way, that uh, energy comes in two forms, okay? And again, you've probably heard these words before. Should be reviewed for you. It might not have been recently, but you know these words. Potential energy and kinetic energy, okay? Um, potential energy is stored energy. It's energy of potential, right? You could potentially use it in the future. I like to think of that carrot stick or candy bar or, much more obviously, a battery as potential energy. All right. Then kinetic energy, you may know the word kinesthesis or kinesthetics. Okay, we, we love that kina prefix there. That talks about motion. Okay, that's the kina part. And... Um, so kinetic energy is energy of motion. Well, you put that battery in your toy robot or your race car and it moves. You put that carrot stick or Twinkie into your body and it makes energy for you to move. Some energy better than others, right? Some batteries, I should say, are better than others. And what we see, uh, I don't want to jump ahead of my slides here, but what we see uh, is, is hopefully right off the bat here, a connection between these two, okay? You use this potential energy to perform kinetic energy. All right, so got to talk about this. Can't go very far with a conversation about energy without mentioning thermodynamics. Way back when, when we talked about scientific method and we talked about laws, surely I brought up thermodynamics. Okay, There's a couple laws. Uh, we're just going to talk about the first one, not right, uh, right now. And you have, um, again, undoubtedly heard of this. Pardon me, I'm going to... I had a stage in my life when I, I felt I really thought you guys needed to know that uh, capital E was shorthand for energy. And uh, almost every slide, I've just spent uh, about an hour going through these slides, making them look new and fancy. Do you like them, by the way? Very schnazzy, aren't they? Um, so I, I went through and made a lot of corrections, one of which was getting rid of uh, the shorthand uh, energy there in just about every slide. Yeah, see right here, potential E. Let's fix that too. Um, potential energy. There's no reason we just can't spell it right here, all right? Um, but we do want to use its abbreviation. Um, we'll just do this PE. And then there we go, stored energy. Like that. And then let's do this.
So anyhow, we were talking about thermodynamics. While I'm typing here, I'm capable of doing two things at once, I hope. Um, and uh, thermodynamics tells you that you could neither create nor destroy energy. Now, depending on what class you first learn this in, physical science, um, chemistry, it, it varies where kids hear this first, all right? Um, your teacher might have said, uh, you could neither create nor destroy matter. Okay? That's not a different law. It's not a different rule. What we're saying is, is that at some point, energy and matter are, are the same thing. Okay? So in saying that you could neither create nor destroy energy, you're, you're also saying you could neither create nor destroy matter. Synonymous. All right. So, anyhow, um, that is the law of conservation of energy, or you may have seen it as the law of conservation of mass, or the law of conservation of matter. Again, it depends what textbook, what class, subject class, uh, you're in when you first uh, hear about this. But again, they're all essentially the same idea, much better and accurately called just the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, So in saying that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, we're saying an awful lot right here, an awful lot. Uh, oh, let's get back into presentation mode, sorry. Uh, what we're saying is that um, since the beginning of everything, okay, whatever you want to hold is the beginning of everything, um, we have had the same energy, matter, uh, mass, present. Same stuff. Same total sum. We'll call it 10 pounds. It's not 10 pounds, but just to pick a number out of random. Okay, we've had 10 pounds of, of energy forever. And everything that ever has existed, everything that ever currently exists, everything that ever will exist has been made out of that same energy. Okay? Now, that's a lot to swallow. It really is. It brings a whole lot of things uh, for personal things for many people into question and so on and so forth. All right. It reminds us of one of my favorite sayings from the 70s. We're all stardust, baby. Okay. It brings that up. Going back to our very early conversations. Not very early, but our earlier conversations about how stars are, um, are fusion engines for elements. Okay. And we, we made these elements in the very beginning. And, and those same elements have been floating around forever and ever, being recycled time after time after time. So, it brings a whole lot into play there, and we don't really need to get deep and or philosophical right now. We just uh, really want to keep this in the back of our mind, okay, um, with regards to energy transfer and energy transition. So, again, summarizing, total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. And it simply changes back and forth from one form to another. Right now, we want to talk about something called heat energy. Heat energy is a mixture of two things. Um, kinetic energy and radiant energy. Radiant energy is a new word for today's lecture. Again, you may have heard of it before. Um, you've certainly heard of a radiator, right? And what does a radiator do? A radiator radiates heat, all right? So keep that in mind as you're trying to figure out what, what, we're, what we're doing here. Uh, you, might find, you might have said that somebody radiates happiness or somebody radiates uh, despair. Um, we use the word radiate to mean give off, right? They radiate bad vibes or good vibes or, or whatever you might say. So energy of motion and energy that is given off. And that's where um, this might seem a little confusion here. You say, well, isn't giving something off? Isn't that movement? Isn't that? Yeah, but it's, it's special. It's special because this, this radiant energy is actually 
um, something that's going to get stored and and used for other purposes. So stay with us on this one. It's pretty neat. All right. I'm going to throw another new word at you. Temperature. Temperature. Temperature is a measure of an object's kinetic energy. Say, wait a minute. We've been everyone's taking their temperature lately, right? Um, so what you're telling me is that you're uh, measuring your kinetic energy? No, you're not. Um, it's actually a very cool video about um, thermometers that I'm going to show you guys. I, I never thought I'd utter those words either, right? A very cool video about thermometers, but honest to God, it's uh, it's it's pretty neat, and it'll show you exactly. Um, how and or why a, a thermometer works um, so I won't go into it right now but um, but yeah that's that's what temperature is all right it's the average speed of an object's molecules the average speed of an object's molecules uh, the idea being uh, obviously that higher speeds equal higher temperatures and why don't I spell that out here um, that um, the the corollary is true uh, lower speeds uh, equals uh, lower temperatures. Okay. So when you take a temperature reading, okay, with your thermometer, and uh, you get a very high number, you could assume that the molecules in that object are moving faster than the molecules in an object uh, where you've got a much lower reading. All right. We have three, actually there's, there's many ways. There are three common, three common ways for measuring temperature. Uh, again, in, in trying to find some videos to show in this class, uh, I realized there's a... Uh, a temperature scale that's used only for making cheese in Italy, Italy and Switzerland. All right, uh, kind of silly there, kind of limited use, but but whatever works, they make good cheese, right? So we're, we'll we'll let them be with that. Uh, but yeah, they they have their own temperature scale for making uh, cheese. We don't need that on a daily basis, so you don't hear about it. But you've certainly heard about Fahrenheit, okay? And you've most probably heard about Celsius. Some of you, Kelvin, some of you not. Okay. Um, they're all related. They're all connected. And many folks will argue that one is better than the other. If you grew up in America here, many of you did. Some of you did not. You grew up with Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, pretty much we're the only place left on the planet that uses Fahrenheit. Everyone else has gone, uh, well, has gone, has always been uh, Celsius. Kelvin is more for science. Okay? Kelvin is more for science. So, Lord Kelvin, uh, you'll, you'll read all about him. Last name actually isn't Kelvin. Okay? Um, he did work with, um, he's famous for, let's just say, He's famous for absolute zero. All right. Absolute zero. And um, absolute zero is the temperature at which all molecular movement ceases. And he started his temperature scale there, zero degrees Kelvin. Okay. Now that happens to be minus 273 degrees Celsius. Minus 273 Celsius is zero degrees Kelvin. I think I first encountered that probably in chemistry class. So if you've heard, had chemistry before, uh, you've more than likely heard it. You will not hear in said chemistry class, uh, more than likely, this minus 459 Fahrenheit. Okay, uh, That's just in there for you Fahrenheit folks. But minus 273 Celsius equals zero degrees Kelvin. I, I think I still remember that as my multiple choice test on one of the chemistry uh, multiple choice question on one of the chemistry tests I, I had to take. Um, 
absolute zero is 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 neat. Okay, but if you go back to the idea, the concept that that temperature is a measure of a molecule's speed, right? Absolute zero makes makes perfect sense uh, in that same chemistry class. I, I didn't have the best grasp of chemistry. I've probably mentioned that to you before. Um, I, I just didn't study enough. I really didn't. Uh, so in retrospect, right, everything makes more sense in retrospect. But I didn't have the best grasp. Maybe I was doodling on my page or, or whatever. But for the longest time, I thought absolute zero was just a temperature that's so damn cold that not even molecules could move. Okay? I didn't get that temperature was molecular speed. I, I missed that part. So just absolute zero, oh my god, it's so cold. Even the molecules, you know, they're like... A, I'm not going anywhere, okay? In fact, though, with that tidbit of knowledge, tiniest little tidbit of knowledge, that temperature is measure of molecular speed, absolute zero, is a perfect starting point. So, there you go. Makes perfect sense now. All right. Now, and, and please don't get all stressy. I'm not going to have you spouting out conversions and, and whatnot um, for the test, okay? I'm just trying to give you some, some relationship here. Um, but uh, you, you, you might want to know some basic factoids, okay? But I will not, I promise you, you won't have to do math. You won't have to do math. All right, so speaking of which, okay? So uh, if minus 273 Celsius is zero degrees Kelvin, 273 degrees Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius, which happens to be 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Probably knew this connection, that 32 Fahrenheit is zero Celsius, right? You knew that one. So now we're adding Kelvin into the mix. So what we're dropping is the minus sign here. You notice that? Okay. So 273 Kelvin is zero Celsius is 32 Fahrenheit. So now you guys have the potential to measure the weather outside temperature in degrees Kelvin, should you want to. Impress your friends. Yeah, they'll probably just blink at you, but you never know. You might have cool friends. <laughs> All right, so Fahrenheit, Lord Fahrenheit, right? Well, not Lord Fahrenheit, but that was somebody's last name. Um, Fahrenheit is a scale, again, that we're familiar with. 32 degrees, water freezes. You might not remember this one, even though it was in the lab, very first lab of the semester, right? These little factoids. Water boils, 212. Between 32 and 212, if you never did the math, there are 180 equal divisions, which we call degrees. Very nice, neat math there. 180 is kind of a special number. Okay, 32, 212, and 180 in between. Celsius. Used to be called centigrade. Some people still refer to it as centigrade. Um, you'll learn a little about that when you watch the, the video. This one, um, like most uh, metric, is, is uh, based in 100 or 10, if you want to call it that. Um, and it makes, it really does make a whole lot of sense, okay? Um, just in, in America, we grew up cringing at it, you know? Um, and, and because they're so totally unconnected, Fahrenheit and Celsius, as you'll see in a, in a moment, converting between the two is, it can be done, but it's, it's, it's annoying. Um, so centigrade starts with zero at water freezing and goes to 100 where water boils. There's 100 degrees in between them. Also somebody's last name. Okay. So a Celsius degree is 1.8 times bigger than a Fahrenheit degree. All right. So, you know I love to round. I, I, not that I hate decimals, but just math is so much easier if you round. And, you you know, out in life, do you really have to be that 
specific when it comes to chem to to, to te temperature, right? Uh, you say it's 80 degrees, and your friend's going to say, "No, it's 82." No, it's 78. No, they're not going to, you know. Yeah, maybe. Again, goes back to your friends, right? But uh, point being, point being, is that you can roughly, if you round that up to two, okay, makes your math a lot easier. Makes your math a lot easier. Basically, it boils down to the conversion between 180 increments and 100 increments. Um, so you've got a, a factor there of 1.8. Uh, that's where the 1.8 comes into the whole thing. But um, so every increase or decrease of, of 1 degree Celsius is, is more or less an increase of 2 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Okay. Let's not even talk about this 5 ninths, but, you know, that's the equivalent of your, your 1.8. All right. Now, why aren't those blue? I told you I just went through and redid a lot of these, and that's where these funky little icons came from. I'm just wondering why the thermometer is gray instead of nice, pretty blue like this side is. Uh, I'll fix that after the fact. So this one now is Kelvin versus Celsius, okay? And as we saw earlier... Uh, Kelvin to Celsius is uh, a good bit cleaner. All right, good bit cleaner in your conversions there. All right, I'm going to actually end this conversation right here. Um, we'll pick up where we left off in the next video.